So let me first start off with mega trends. And you know, uh, Frost and Sullivan is a very unique company in the sense that we cover a wide range of industries. All the industries potentially that you serve, the customers that you serve, from automotive to energy to uh, telecoms, healthcare, aerospace, defense, a wide range of these industries. And as it happens in every single company, each of the business units tend to work in silos, right? They don't talk to each other. And they serve their individual customers. The automotive clients think we only do automotive work. The energy clients think we do only energy work. Right? So about four or five years ago, we said we need to start doing things together. We need to push our teams to work together because the biggest opportunity for innovation comes through the convergence of industries. That's how we came up with the theme called Megatrends and said, let's identify those megatrends that will have a profound impact on business, society, and culture over the course of next decade. And if we can understand that, then we'll help our clients to integrate those megatrends into their business. So we assembled a global analyst team of about 200 analysts from various business units to come together, collaborate, and pick up some of these trends. Let me start off by defining what a megatrend is. You know? And we kept the definition very simple. It should have three main characteristics. You know? One, it should be global. Because today, we all participate in a global economy. You know, competition is global. Uh, WhatsApp or Airbnb or any of these next generation companies, as they start, they start off with the premise of being global on day one of their business. And that gives you a significant competitive advantage. Second is the megatrend should have a transformative impact. It should have a transformative impact on business, society, and culture. And third, that impact should be sustained over a period of time. So if it meets these three characteristics, then we say, you know, great. You know, and it can be qualified as a megatrend. Now, there are over 50 megatrends, you know, and, but I'm picking up about 10 of them today, 11 of them to discuss. I won't be able to cover all of them. I picked up these 11 because I think, you know, some of which you all are familiar with, I want to bring in perspective some of the big trends that are impacting your customers. And so I'll use that as a, as, an, as a way for helping you think about understanding them and what it means to your business moving forward. So as I present in events, you know, it's a large audiences like you guys, uh, and everybody is busy with their you know, uh, Facebook and WhatsApp, and you know, people pretend to be paying attention, but they're really not. Right? So how do I get the attention of people? So I think, you know, why this mega trends is important to me, Manoj Manan, right? If it, if, it, if it interests me at a personal level, then I'm sure it will interest you at a personal level. And then you will pay full attention for the next 35, 40 minutes. Right? So as I thought about it, why is it important to me? It really dawned on me. It is important to me because of my family, right? because of my kids, right? So can I try and understand what this mega trends means to my family, right? Now, over the course of next 10 years, I'm going to take some very big decisions about my children, right? Will they study telecoms or healthcare? No. I need to decide where I will put my savings, whatever little money I make. Should I put it in Enix or should I invest in Apple or Google or what kind of company should I invest? I need to decide which geography I'm gonna live in. Yeah. So as I, if I pick up these megatrends and understand the context of these megatrends, then maybe I will be in a better position to make some decisions. So it is in that perspective I want you to think about megatrends. So as I talk about it, people say, okay, great, you're going to talk about the future. Can you go back? You, know, you are an analyst in telecoms. Can you tell us the megatrends that had the biggest impact on your life, your career in the last 10 years? So I took up a piece of paper and I scribbled a few things that instantly came to my mind. You know? What really had big impact on my customers and my career in the last 10 years? You know? And some of them are very simple. You know, number one was globalization. If you really globalized your business, there are companies which have operations in you know, today 100, 150, 200 countries, then they did extremely well. 
right? Frost and Sullivan had operations in less than 10 countries a decade ago. Today, we are in 44. And that has changed the way our company has grown and evolved and the value propositions we take to our customers. The internet has transformed so many industries. You see the power of convergence, you know? Convergence between so many industries giving great value proposition. I think the biggest and the best story of convergence was when Steve Jobs actually launched the iPhone. As he made his launch speech, he said, I'm gonna launch three great products today. A revolutionary internet device, I'm gonna launch a revolutionary phone, and I'm gonna launch a widescreen iPod. I'm gonna launch three great products today. Then he goes on to say, it's not three, it is just one product. And how that one product category changed our entire lives for the last, you know, about eight or nine years. You know? Creating about 150 to 200 billion dollars of revenues year after year. And I think this, we are still at the beginning of this trend of convergence. We're going to see the growth from emerging markets in the last decade. We saw some business model changes. Companies saying, let me leverage on outsourcing providers who are good at doing certain things instead of me doing it myself. Move away from a capex-based spending to an opex-based spending. And all of which yielded great successes for many companies. You know? Some companies did extremely well. They grew very rapidly. And some companies you know, failed. They failed to see these mega trends, like Kodak. They invented the digital camera, they understood it, but they failed to integrate it into their business at a rapid pace. And we'll see many more of these Kodak moments moving forward, because these mega trends are colliding with each other to create new value propositions. Now, none of the mega trends I'm going to talk about is new, but I want you to try and understand the context and essence and how companies are adopting these mega trends and integrating it into their business. Let me start off with the first and the most important mega trend. And, you know, we touched upon it earlier today. There is no bigger mega trend than this, you know, which is the trend of urbanization. I have a question for you, and I've got a chocolate if you answer the question well. Yeah? The person who answers first obviously will get it. Which is the first city in the world to have a population of a million people? Sorry? Singapore. Ah, oh, that's a good try. <laughs> who, who is that? Who said that? Uh, you deserve a chocolate anyway. Oh. <laughs> See, I told you Singapore is a better city. <laughs> the answer is not right, but okay. Which is the first city in the world to have a population of a million people? Sorry? New York. London. No, no. No, sorry. There are a lot more questions coming. You will get chocolates. <laughs> sorry? Not Beijing. The answer is Rome. <laughs> you know, Rome was the first city in the world to have a population of a million people. The next city was London. And it took 18 centuries after Rome for London to get to a million people. 18 centuries. Right? At the start of the year 2000, there were roughly about 250 to 300 million, sorry, at the start of year 1900, about 110 years ago, there were roughly about 250 million people who lived in urban centers around the world. Right? But from 1900 to 2000, or till now, we saw a massive wave of urbanization. That number moved from 250 million to 3.2 billion. Right? Such a big trend. What happens as a result of this? The wealth of the countries reside in the cities. Right? The wealth of the countries reside in the cities. The biggest challenges we face are in the cities. Transportation, chronic diseases, you know, energy. All of these challenges are in the biggest cities around the world. And this trend of urbanization is going to continue. I think they plan for 30 years into the future. And they are faced with challenges on infrastructure, on transportation, on healthcare. Japan had the best energy situation in the world about seven, eight years ago. After the Fukushima earthquake, they are dealing with an energy crisis. Right? So the space of urbanization is going to continue. So how do we understand what beyond the trend of urbanization? How do you peel it further? And as we look at it further, we see subtrends. You know, we see mega cities, we see mega regions, we see mega corridors. So the cities are going to expand and going to get bigger. There will be more cities that will emerge with a population of greater than five million. Right? There will be mega regions formed. You know, I grew up in India. The capital of India is Delhi. And those of you who are familiar with India, next to Delhi is another city called Gurgaon very close to each other, less than a kilometer away. 
That has a population of about four or five million. You have another city on the other side of Delhi called Noida, you know, which is kind of a call center hub for the world. Another four or five million people. You put these three cities together, next to each other, they form a mega region with about 25 million people, almost as big as a country. And yet, we treat India as a country. We need to be organized maybe around cities because the opportunity is around cities. The wealth is based around the cities, right? We see the development of mega corridors. You know, very close to Hong Kong is Shenzhen. Shenzhen is gonna connect with Guangzhou. About 120 million people. The governments are working to develop this corridor. They will integrate it and they will create competencies which will make it effective for them to compete in the global marketplace. We will also see the continuous growth of slums because many developing countries will struggle to deal with the people coming in and there will be challenges associated with sanitation, etc. So how do you take this and you adapt it to your business? Uh, I want to give you a couple of examples of companies who are taking this mega trend and applying it. Huh? One of the best examples that we always talk about is Siemens. Right? Siemens, as you know, went through a very tough time in uh, mid-2000s, you know, 2005 to 2007. They divested from many, many different parts of the businesses, communications, etc. And this focused on three core areas, healthcare, energy, and industry. And then the CEO realized their transformation was not complete because the biggest opportunity they realized is in the build out of the new cities around the world. Right? So they created a new division called infrastructure in cities, focused on selling to city mayors, a completely different kind of customers, working on public-private partnerships to enable the growth of smart cities uh, around the world. Let's take another industry which we are all very familiar and passionate about, you know, particularly in Hong Kong and Singapore, shopping. Right? What is going to happen because of the mega trend of you know, urbanization? So in Singapore, for example, there are about 125 McDonald's outlets serving about 4.5 million people. Over the course of next decade, maybe McDonald's will need to you know, double their sales. How will they do it? You know, they will open more outlets. But what will happen to these outlets? We think the outlets will be smaller. You know, because to capture the footprint better, they will enable us to come in and go out faster. So as we look at the new supermarkets and hypermarkets, we think they'll be much smaller in size as compared to the larger ones. And we're already seeing that trend shaping itself around us. So this is the first mega trend, right? Now I will start quickly going through the rest because I believe you're getting a hang of how to understand this mega trend and how does it apply. The second one I want to talk about, we call it smart as the new green, right? Now, over the last decade, there was a lot of discussion on saying, let's become environmentally friendly. Huh? Let's focus on building a greener environment. There were a lot of projects, renewable energy, alternative fuel, et cetera, et cetera. Now, many of these projects struggled. It struggled because it all depended on the price of oil. If the price of oil went down, then those projects were not viable. Right? We think as we look into the future, it is not just about gre being green for the sake of being green. It is possible to use smart technology to enable the green initiatives, to enable the green planet initiatives. Let me give you a very perfect example of something that happened earlier this year. Right? What you see on this picture is a thermostat. Right? Honeywell sells this thermostat for, if you go onto the Amazon store, you will find it for 25 or 30 US dollars. Right? And they're the world's biggest leader in making thermostats. A group of engineers left Apple and they said, if we want to make this thermostat sexy, how would you do it? You know? How would you try and sell this product category for 10 times the price? Is it possible? Right? So what they did is they formed a company called Nest. And they took the thermostat, put little software in it, put some Wi-Fi in it, put a nice LCD screen, and suddenly uh, average thermostat became a learning thermostat sold in the market for 350 US dollars. And what it does is it communicates back to the customer. It learns the customer habits. It helps you manage energy. It helps you save energy and achieve the green objectives just by being smart, right? And you can see how the thermostat communicates variety of different things. And this is just the beginning. I believe everything around us is gonna get smart, you know? That's why you hear about smart infrastructure, smart grids, smart bandages, Smart, smart Singapore, uh, <laughs> dumb Hong Kong. <laughs> Sorry, you don't have any more speaking time left, so I get to rub it in. <laughs> 
And what we also see is the convergence of competition. Competition between, you know, no one company can enable this set of solution to come together. You need participants from the entire ecosystem, from building automation, to energy, to telecommunications, to IT. And this is just a, a small uh, cross-section. You know, the smart city market is going to be the single biggest industry in the world. $1.5 trillion of opportunity by the year 2020, right? And no one company can do it. People have to necessarily form strategic partnerships to make it possible, right? Let me move on to the third one, right? the social trends. And Social trends is to do with the growth of population, you know. The world population is going to grow from roughly about, you know, 6.8 billion to 7.55 billion, you know, over the course of next six, seven years. Now, what is interesting is there are two sub-trends within it. First one is the el elderly population or the aging population, people above the age of 65. Today, they are roughly 0.55 billion, you know that is going to more than double to 1.2 billion. So as number of people, many of us in this room will be above 65, right? And by 2020, then, you know, they'll put a lot of pressure on the healthcare infrastructure. The governments don't have the funds to deal with it. You know? Governments spend anywhere between 5 to 10% of GDP on healthcare. That will have to more than double if the current patterns continue. So how do you deal with it, right? The other interesting part is that we have a Gen Y population of about 2.2 billion. That is going to go to 2.5 billion. Right? That in itself is not the most interesting part. More interesting is that almost 60% of this Gen Y is going to be within you know, three hours of flying time from the city. 60% of the world's Gen Y. Right? Between, between Indonesia, Thailand, Philippines, India, and China. You know? And this Gen Y really determines future products and services. They will be the biggest consumers in the next decade. Right? And they communicate in completely different ways to you and me. You know, we are still stuck up on email. They are on a broadcast communication format. Right? And their values and beliefs are completely different. They start off with personalization at a very, very young age. You know? My young daughter, if you look at her MacBook, it is completely personalized by her, both the exterior and the interior. Right? She personalizes it at such a very young age and she starts expecting this in every future product and service that she wants. Right? You know, I grew up, my mom and my teachers would say, hey, drink some milk. You need uh, you know, calcium, your bones will be strong. These kids are taught differently. They said, hey, you know, take care of the environment. That is their number one thing that they are taught. And that is going to manifest itself into every product that they're going to consume. They're already influencing my purchase decision. Imagine what is going to happen over the course of next five, seven years. They don't drink Coke anymore you know, because they become so conscious about what it means to them. So we are going to see preferences shift at a very, very rapid pace. Let me move on to the fourth one, you know, economic trends. We talked a lot about Brazil, Russia, India, China. What beyond that? What are the future growth markets? You know, can we try and focus on them? Now, there are different pockets of growth around the world. Um, you know, there is uh, Egypt, Turkey, Poland, South Africa offer some growth opportunities. But there is also a good opportunity within ASEAN. We see some very strong governments come into play. You know, in Philippines, we have a very good president there now who's been driving the economic development agenda. We have a new president in Indonesia. And you know, India also is going to be now a very strong force to reckon with. Within 90 days of being in power, the Prime Minister has unleashed a, a, a major change in the development in the country. So we're going to see this region become really exciting over the course of next decade. So you have to be able to prioritize the business around this region and customers around this region and the growing multinationals from this region. Because they represent not only a Gen Y population, they also represent potentially the fastest growing economies in the world over the next seven to ten years. Let me move to Megatrend 5, uh, technology. Right? And there are so many things in technology. Uh, it is, maybe we could just do a whole session on technology, but let me cover a few things so that we understand what technology implications are there on several industries. The first and the biggest uh, trend within technology is that of connected devices, you know, or the internet of things, or we call it the trend of connectivity. Roughly today in the world, there are between seven to eight billion devices connected to the internet. 
These includes our smartphones, our iPhones, our uh, you know, iPads, Kindle, about uh, PCs. These are all connected to the internet, about seven to eight billion of them. Now what is happening is the cost of radio is dropping so dramatically that you can actually embed the radio into everything, right from the thermostat to your coffee cup, right? And what it does is, as everything gets connected, there will be about 80 to 90 billion devices around us that are connected. 500 per square kilometer, 10 in our home, 5 on our personal bodies, right? And this has huge implications on business models because now companies will know exactly how products are being consumed, right? And therefore, you will need to start adopting and adopting different approaches to sell to customers because they know that you know. And so you better start responding more efficiently. Right? The next trend is about cloud. And cloud is, you know, have, is a big game changer. It is a big leveler. It enables small companies to compete with big companies. Huh? Four young guys can start a company of mobile gaming, and they can service a billion customers around the world without owning any IT infrastructure in a very, very short period of time, all by using their credit card competing with the biggest companies in the world. Right? I'll give you another example, Netflix. Netflix is, owns about 25% of traffic in the United States on the internet, is Netflix. And Netflix doesn't own any computing infrastructure. It's run off Amazon. 25% of the internet traffic in the United States is Netflix, and Netflix doesn't own inf internet, doesn't own the computing infrastructure, doesn't own the server infrastructure. They have tremendous agility and cloud enables that. And we will see big changes. The existing hardware companies in the IT industry are gonna see some major tough challenges moving ahead. Many of them may perish unless they change their business model. Big data, you know, as 80 billion devices get connected, you know, we have a lot of data within our company. A lot of new data is being collected. Customers are talking on social media. Can we connect it all together? You know, can we start predicting where the demand is going to come from so that we are more efficient in our manufacturing? Automotive companies are beginning to learn, oh, what are consumers searching? What category of cars are they searching? What kind of features are they searching? And let's work towards integrating that into the production facilities closest to that place. So they're able to predict demand much more efficiently. And we'll see this big data being influenced in you know, every other space as well. The other interesting area is in terms of video. You know, we are still at the infancy about use of video. Right? Video is going to get embedded into a lot of things around us. Apple just introduced the iWatch. Yeah? First, Apple introduced touch, and touch changed the way we communicate with the computers. Now they have introduced the iWatch, and iWatch has a haptic feature. Right? You don't even need to look at the watch. It will give you, you know, uh, beats, and you, you can feel it. Uh, they're opening up an entire new category. As these new forms of touch and other interfaces come in, that will collide with mobility to create a new set of experiences. The next one is innovating to zero. Now, this is a very fun category. Right? Innovating to zero was a term uh, coined by Bill Gates, uh, where he, you know, he was very passionate about you know, contributing back to making the world a better place. So he said, let's innovate to zero carbon emissions. Right? And what can we do collectively to innovate to zero carbon emissions? So we said, hey, let's take that trend of innovating to zero and apply that as a, as a, as a discipline of studying about innovation. You know? Can we apply innovate to zero for our businesses? Right? So what does it mean? Innovate to zero waste. Very, very important for our business. Right? Innovate to zero breaches of security. Great. You know? Innovate to zero email. Right? We all wait for the next email to come in our office, and we waste so much of our time. Right? If you do a poll of youngsters, you know, many of them, and maybe all of you are young, I'm kind of assuming you're not young. Let me do a quick poll with you. Question to you guys. How many of you, for your personal activity, right, you send more emails than social media? Raise your hand. For your personal activity. For your personal activity, you send more emails than social media, right? A few of them, aging population, <laughs> right? Now, in our personal lives, social media is the way to communicate. It is far more efficient, far more effective. You get to collaborate. Yet within our offices, we fail to adopt this technology. Can we innovate to zero email? 
So a company called Atos Origin said, let's innovate to zero email. So starting from 1st Jan 2013, they went with a zero email policy for internal communication. Only with customers, we'll do email, right? Change and shake up the way we communicate and collaborate to drive greater innovation in the business. So I have a few more chocolates to give. So I want to ask, what does innovate to zero mean for you guys? Any interesting comments? For every comment, there is a few chocolate. You wanted a chocolate, say something. Huh? Innovate to zero debt. Uh -huh. That is true, that is a good one. What else? Innovate to zero. You guys are sleeping? <laughs> Innovate to z save money, zero money saved. <laughs> I don't want to give you a chocolate for that. <laughs> Huh? He's saying innovate to zero waste. He's cheating. You know, this is what Hong Kong does. It is there on the slide. <laughs> anyway, let's be nice. Let's be friends. <laughs> innovate to zero traffic. Yeah, okay. Great. So I think innovate to zero can apply in so many different ways to our businesses, right? Move to the next one. We call it bricks and clicks, right? Uh, the retail industry forms the backbone of almost every single economy. Now, the last 10 years, particularly in the United States, we have seen a massive move towards online commerce. Companies like Amazon and all have done extremely well, right? And we will see that trend continue. Now, China boasts of some of the largest e-commerce companies in the world. We are beginning to see the same trend happen in India. The same trend happened in Southeast Asia. This is going to be a completely new industry, completely new set of market participants are coming on board and challenging the existing large retailers, just like in every other, uh, every other country in the United States as well. Now what we are seeing moving forward is that it is not just about online commerce. It is about integrating online commerce with offline commerce. And if we can do that well, then you can have a game-changing value proposition. We're seeing many examples of this already coming up. So Tesco is a large uh, you know, hypermarket in, in South Korea. They're number two there. They said, hey, I want to become number one. Right? A typical way to be number one in, a, in this industry is open more hypermarkets. What happens when you open more hypermarkets? You have more competition. You have more capacity than, uh, than the demand. And somebody will lose money. They said, how do we change it without actually opening so many physical stores? So they brought the hypermarket closer to the customer. Every subway station has digital signages and they simulate the hypermarket, right? And you can, as you wait for your subway, you can, you know, you start off your shopping, you may not complete it. You can continue doing it in your subway ride and the goods get delivered at home. You know, a smarter way to enable a faster growth in market share. And they have done so well it is now done in many other countries. You'll see this in Australia. I'm sure many parts of uh, Tesco has already introduced this in many parts of Europe as well. You know, I wanted to also demonstrate that this power of bricks and clicks is even getting into some industries that we thought it would not happen. So online shopping for cars. Huh? Audi has now launched the first digital car showroom. Right? The reason people didn't do it very efficiently in the past is because it was not personalized. So Audi has now created a personalized shopping experience for you, just like when you go to the store in the online site. A personal concierge will assist you. You, know, you get to see the product, you get to define your specs, and then you get to continue that experience as you go into the store. Right? So a better integration of online and offline. And this is just the beginning. You know, think about mobility, we think about the video, think about the virtual spaces, and see how that will start evolving to create you know, yet new possibilities. Talking about mobility, you know, this is again a big industry, the automotive industry, which is also going through huge transformation. Right? On one end, many companies are saying, we need to go electric, we need to make electric vehicles. You know, companies like Tesla in the US already are you know, valued at about 18 to 20 billion US dollars. You know, almost half the market capitalization of a General Motors in a very, very short span of time. We predict that at least 15% of all cars sold in 2020 will be electric vehicles. Right? Now, what does it mean? It has huge implications. You know? Because think about the battery in your iPhone. You know? 
It is so small. An electric vehicle is so big. You need maybe 100,000 batteries to power a car. Think about the charging infrastructure. You know, think about how, how we need to manage the battery. The biggest cost in the car may be batteries. You know? So renting, you may buy the cars based on how, many, how much you will drive. And you may have you know, pay-as-you-go models for, for you know, uh, the battery consumption that you will do. A whole new set of market participants, right, from infrastructure players to battery manufacturers to charging station manufacturers. You know? We're going to see a completely new ecosystem evolve over the course of the next six to seven years. So this is one way of innovation. The other wave of innovation in the automotive industry is what Google is doing with autonomous cars. Right? What Google is saying is, man, the automotive industries are doing it completely the wrong way. You know? They focus on making the car safe after an accident. Right? So once an accident happens, you will be safe. Hey, but the airline industry treats it very differently. They focus on preventing accidents, right? They put navigational software inside. Because if there is an accident in the airline, you're gone anyway, right? So they say, hey, let's pick up that technology and put it in the car and make the car autonomous so that it can take us faster and more efficiently point A to point B. And if the car is autonomous, there is zero accident, then it can be lighter, right? It can be lighter. It can go maybe 1,000 kilometers a gallon, right? and it'll be more efficient, then I can drink and drive, you know, all kinds of possibilities will exist, right? So, we're going to see a lot of range of innovation coming in micro-mobility, you know, many cities are saying you will not drive the car in the last five kilometers in the city. So you need one-wheeler, two-wheeler transportation. Over 125 micro-mobility products are introduced by the big automotive companies, already in the marketplace. You know, motorized vehicles, etc. They're you know even selling it along with existing cars. As you buy a new car, you get a micro mobility solution with it. Car sharing applications, car pooling applications, etc., are also growing very, very rapidly. So, you know, I'll skip this and move on to the next one. And we touched upon this briefly, which is about healthcare. Right? We have to. The governments are under serious pressure to take care of the health care of its citizen in every single country. You know? Providing health care now is the basic expectation in every city. You know, even in developing countries, governments are forced to start dealing with the health care challenge. So how do we deal with it? Right? So traditionally, bulk of the spending in health care is when you fall ill. Uh, you go to the hospital, you go to the doctor when you fall ill, and it is focused on treatment. And if we continue that approach, we will not be able to deal with the aging population, the number of sick people in the world. So we've got to change that paradigm. We've got to change the paradigm to keeping people healthy. You know? Stay healthy. And therefore, you have seen now, you know, early trends are already there. The spas are there in the shopping malls. The clinics are entering the shopping malls. Right? A range of new technology is being introduced focused on prevention. And you can start predicting how your health is. So we see the entire venture capital industry is now focusing on investments in diagnosis and prediction technologies. Right? So again, a lot of new companies. The healthcare industry in the past was egocentric. They wouldn't let other people come into the industry. It was centered around the doctor. Right? It is being challenged completely. Now, when you go to the doctor, you have read about everything before you go to the doctor, right? So, we are going to see a lot more set of companies start participating, and we'll see a new wave of innovation cycle enter there. You know? And, you know, remote healthcare, uh, kiosks, et cetera, et cetera, are all beginning to, you know, make its way there. The tenth and the far more interesting, according to me, is business model innovation. You know, so many of us spend all of our innovation efforts focused on products. Right? But study after study has consistently demonstrated that sustainable benefits for organization in innovation comes through business model innovation. You know? That is what is sustainable, that is what gives you differentiation for a prolonged period of time. Right? So I want to talk a little bit about some of the trends that are driving business model innovation today. Uh, I'll pick up on three of them. There are many themes, but let me start with three of them uh, and, and maybe use that to think about how products and services will be sold and consumed in the future. The first one is pay as you go. Right? It has happened in the IT industry. We don't buy software outright anymore. It is pay as you go. You don't buy computing outright anymore. It is pay as you go. Right? 
So everything in the IT is becoming pay as you go. Everything in every industry should become pay as you go. You know, why should we buy a car? And it lies idle 90% of the time. Can't it be pay as you go? Far more efficient. If you want to be green and environment friendly, it should be pay as you go, right? I remember this, uh, uh, there is a tire manufacturer in Europe, which is now selling tires on a pay as you go model. You know, I will charge you based on how many kilometers you drive. They're not doing it with consumers as yet, but they're doing it with large, you know, uh, trucking companies who are big customers of tires. You know, hey, you know, I will reuse the tires, I will make it efficient, I want an annuity relationship with the customer, rather than keeping on selling tires, you know, on and off. So we'll see pay as you go as a theme, you know, every product has to be turned into a service moving forward. So that is number one. Number two is co-creation of value. How can we co-create value together with our customers? Look at all the successful companies, the Apple, the Google, Facebook, Uber, all of these companies, something very common in them. The innovation in their company is not limited to their engineers, right? Because you can never have enough engineers to do innovation because the world is a global marketplace. There are millions of R&D guys out there. So you need to create a platform on which others can come and innovate. So Apple creates a platform and millions of developers develop on the Apple platform. So if you want to compete with Apple, it is super tough. You know, it is super tough. That is why Samsung is struggling today. Samsung copied the phone, great, but now the Chinese manufacturer have copied the phone and the phones are getting cheaper, so Samsung is struggling. You need that ecosystem and you need to get your partners to develop on the ecosystem. That is how you will be able to accelerate innovation. So the question to you is, what is your co-creation strategy? Do you have a co-creation strategy, right? The third one, N equal to one, R equal to G. We talked about personalization, you know? I am unique as a customer. Can you give me something unique? Because future value is not about selling generalized products and services, you know? That everybody is doing. The Chinese manufacturers are doing. Tomorrow it will be the Vietnamese, right? Can you make it special for me and create unique value for me? If you do that, then I will stick with you longer, you know? And I'll have a better ongoing relationship with you. And R equal to G means resources are global. Am I leveraging the best global resources? Because there are some capabilities better in India, some is better in Vietnam, some is better in Poland. You know, just like we saw the entire uh, you know, team at Enix today, a number of factories around the world, because you want to leverage the power of R equal to G to meet the needs of your customer. Now, let me give you a few examples of companies who are adopting this efficiently, or some companies who are challenging this you know, with the new business model, so that you understand it is not. You know. The first one I want to talk about is a company called drivelikeagirl.com. Right? So they came up with a simple theory that girls between the age of 17 to 25 are the safest drivers. Right? So why should they pay insurance just like you know, me and Jonas and several others who are terrible drivers? Right? Logical. So what they did is they put a small set-top box inside the car, they see how the girl drives, and they help you go and bargain and get better insurance rates with the insurance company. Right? So drive like a girl.com. Now the good thing is you don't need to be a 17 year old girl to drive, uh, to get the policy. As long as you drive like her, you can get the same policy. Right? Now almost every insurance company is adopting this and saying I need to have pay as you go insurance because you know, I drive only 1000 kilometers uh, a month, why should I pay the same insurance like someone else who drives 10,000 kilometers a month? So we need to have different policies in place. As I give the presentation, many people say, you know, this is great, it doesn't apply to my industry. You know, the internet cannot impact my industry, and the hotel industry, hospitality industry is a prime example. They always say, oh, you still need hotels, right? If you don't have hotels, you cannot do business. Now, even they got challenged. A company called Airbnb, right, unlocked existing capacity that you and I have as consumers and throwed it open in the marketplace. Now this is the fastest growing hotel chain in the world without even any capacity, without owning any hotel infrastructure, challenging the big hotel giants around the world. They don't know what to do. Now they have too much surplus rooms, right? How do you deal with this new form of competition? Because somebody is willing to cut price dramatically to compete with you because it is marginal utilization. Hmm? 
Netflix, you know, I talked about it. I said, hey, hey, an existing company is also transforming themselves. They started off as a mail order DVD. Then they moved their entire infrastructure to IT. And now they are even going into producing content because they have now a very good knowledge of their customer, what the customer is actually doing. As a result, Netflix continues to win majority of the Emmys today, right? So you can imagine how this connectedness with the customer creates new value propositions. The final mega trend is a personal mega trend. I talk about a span of influence, right? So the radio took 38 years, TV took 13, internet four years, Facebook two, right? And then our friend Sai, right? You know, he got to 1.2 billion users, 1.2 billion users in six months. You know? Something interesting is happening. Right? So if you have a great product or service, you can actually service a lot of people. Right? The best story of this span of influence is from a professor in Stanford. He left it to start a company called Coursera, Coursera.com, right? providing free education. He said he, taught, he teaches computer science. In the first year of offering the course online, he said, I got 160,000 students. I would have spent my entire lifetime in Stanford, I would never get 160,000 students. Right? His span of influence has you know, increased dramatically. So if you are a great accountant, you can service the world today. If you are a great consultant, you can service the world. If you are a great iPhone manufacturer, right? Apple will launch the iPhone 6, 25 to 30 million pieces will be shipped in one week or two weeks. Right? The span of influence is very, very rapid. Now it has got huge implications because if you're a bad accountant, you don't have a job, right? Now, we'll also see that because of this, as your span of influence is wide, it means you have a higher risk of failure. Industry profits, based on many studies we have done, industry profits on many industries are getting concentrated among two or three companies. Top two or three companies in every industry are now beginning to account for 60, 70, or 80 percent of industry profits because their span of influence is very wide. Now, it may be for a short period of time, but you need to have tremendous agility to deal with it. So, you know, in summary, every single industry, all your customers' industry, including your industry, is undergoing massive transformation. And IT is at the heart of it, you know. Technology and connectivity is at the heart of enabling that transformation. Yeah? I think the CIO's role itself has to change. He is now the chief innovation officer. Right? I do believe that you need a tighter integration of business model along with the business to achieve sustained differentiation. None of the mega trends I talked about today are new and unique to you. You would have heard about urbanization. You have heard about aging healthcare. But why it is fascinating is because they are colliding with each other creating new ideas, new possibilities for business. Yeah? We think that many companies will also you know, raise the risk of failure. Now, this is the most important slide and the takeaway slide for you. What do you think you should do? I think you should look at these mega trends. You know? Select the trends which are important for your business, maybe three or four of them. And then understand the subtrends associated with it. You looked at urbanization, we looked at the subtrends. Now, what does it mean in terms of impact to our industry? What new products and services can we launch, right? And then look at the unmet needs. Just like Google saw the unmet need to have a, a new market space for autonomous cars, you know? How do we look at unmet needs to create new innovation opportunities for our business? I want to leave you with this last quote from Jack Welch. He says, when the rate of change inside the business is exceeded by the rate of change outside, then the end is near. Right? Uh, so I think this is a very challenging time. You know? Every CEO is paranoid about this. Very, very paranoid. Because pace of innovation outside is so intense, it is difficult to keep up. Right? So how do we have that co